is the captain's complete guide to cruising and camping. When it comes to touring, a wise man once said, the more you know, the less you'll take. Captain's crewman Trav obviously never heeded this advice. He treats every boating overnighter like a World War II amphibious landing party. Anyway, when it comes to camping on board or cruising the coastline, we've learned a little bit in our travels. And just to prove it, we've commandeered a Whitley CR 2380, it's bobbing out there behind me, and we're gonna put it all into practice. Location, location. Sounds obvious, yeah. You'd be surprised how many times we've camped overnight in an unknown location. In Cape York, we couldn't find our rendezvous point, so spent the night bobbing at sea at anchor. The moral of the story? Do your research prior to leaving port. Google Earth is awesome for finding campgrounds. Navionics is great for finding sheltered reef and islands when you're off the coast. And the Windy app will help you stay out of the breeze. The key to coastal cruising is having a good plan and navigation. There are plenty of aids including plotters, iPads, mobile phones and books on coastal cruising. Many old school skippers still prefer paper charts for the simple reason that you can get a bigger perspective. Being able to see the entire cruising area on one chart gives you a real idea of the actual distances between your destination and any obstacles in your way. Have a plan B in case the passage becomes too uncomfortable and you need to seek shelter. Your alternative destination should be easy to enter in rough conditions and well sheltered. Plotting a course is the easy part, but calculating the weather and sea conditions is more difficult. Before setting off each morning, check the weather forecast and tides. There are a few things you'll need over and above a day trip, like bedding. When I say bedding, I mean dry bedding. There is nothing worse than a wet swag. So waterproofing is essential. Use bedding that's light but warm and doesn't take up too much space. Food is another useful item for um, you're staying alive, but packing the right food and storing it correctly is critical. If, like us, you're too povo to afford a boat with a fridge, then you're probably gonna be running eskies. To optimize your esky performance, cool it down before packing, then fill it with your goodies and ice and seal it. Pack your perishables and soft foods in snap lock containers to keep the moisture out. Avoid opening and closing the esky as much as possible. As a general rule of thumb, eat your perishable items first and catch or collect as much fresh seafood as you can. If there's more than one boat, we suggest making each boat self-sufficient. When you're on the water, it's not always easy to share resources. The more remote you are, the more tense relationships will be, as well as the need for basic things like food, ice, plastic bags, water, band-aids and beer. Did we mention beer? Here's a basic shopping list that can be turned into a range of different meals. All you need to do is catch some fresh seafood and you'll have a diverse menu every night. All right, let's talk power. And to be honest, unless you're Harry Butler of the ocean, it's hard to be fully off the grid. We need those watts for charging phones and cameras as well as laptops. Batteries also come in handy for things like uh, starting the bloody boat. So make sure you're not using more power than your vessel is offering. Does it have a monitor or cutoff switch to avoid draining the battery fully? Ideally, you've got a spare battery wired properly so it can't be killed as you play Credence Clearwater Revival long into the night. A spare power bank is also very handy. Boat lighting like deck lights and under gunnel LEDs are awesome for keeping the party pumping late into the night. They do suck some serious battery juice though, so make sure you carry independent light sources like a head torch in case your voltage gets low. Good communications. A radio provides a direct line of communications with other vessels and shore-based coast guard and marine rescue stations. These organizations are also excellent sources of information about local weather and sea conditions, as well as providing information on any coastal bars you need to navigate. If you're two nautical miles offshore, you're going to need an EPIRB and make sure that baby's in date. You're also going to need a fully operational marine radio. Check your local authority guidelines around usage. If you're traveling long distances offshore in super remote country, a sat phone is definitely a worthwhile investment. Be sure to pack properly so you can actually access the ship that you need when you want it. Prioritize the stuff you need around easily accessible areas. Pay attention to weight distribution and avoid loading one side with all your eskies and fuel and tie shit down. Be mindful that if you're loading your boat and trailer up, you're probably creeping towards your gross vehicle mass. 
Under the extra load, axles, tyres, bearings, and even gearboxes on tow vehicles will fail. We'd know, we've done them all. If you can set your anchor correctly and with confidence, you won't have to rely on moorings and marinas when cruising the coast. A well-set anchor also means you can leave your boat at anchor and go ashore, safe in the knowledge your anchor will not drag. The first step to anchoring is to ensure you have the right ground tackle and that it's in good working order. Anchors will work more effectively with a stock holding horizontally. Chain is your best friend, and if you have enough out, it will drive the anchor deeper into the sea floor rather than pulling it out. The second step is to check the location. What is the quality of the holding ground like? How fast is the tide or current expected to be? A rule of thumb is that one knot of current is equal in effect to about 10 to 15 knots of wind. Is it sheltered from the weather? Wind and swell are common causes of anchors dragging. The worse the conditions, the more rope and chain you'll need to pay out. Is there enough swinging room when the tide or weather changes? Is there enough water depth when the tide drops? If you plan on rafting up with your buddy's boat, fenders, fenders and more fenders, especially if you're leaving them overnight. Obviously safety gear is also bloody important, as are things like tools and spare parts. Equipment requirements may vary, so check with your state marine authorities. So by now you should have a nice full belly aboard a safe boat at anchor in your dry, warm bed. But do you have the following? They're often left out on overnight trips. Things like insect repellent, spare batteries, head torches, dry towels, plastic bags, toilet paper, and dry bags. So, how did the 2380 perform as a touring weapon? These Whitleys are literally built for liverboard adventures. At 7.6 metres long and 2.44 in the beam, there's enough room for your entire fam, or you could just get cosy with six of your best mates. Speaking of being cosy, the 2380 is an absolute gin palace with seating galore. There's a large L-shaped lounge that runs along the stern and up the starboard side. This can also be converted into a double bed. Moving to the bow, in the lockable cabin, there's a super bougie love nest, which we set up beautifully last night. She carries 210 litres of fuel, which gives you an awesome cruising range with the 150 horsepower Yamaha. There's also a 100 litre freshwater tank, so you won't be going thirsty. The 2380 has a variable dead rise hull that's 20 degrees at the transom. This gives you a smooth ride when the going gets choppy and a stable platform when you're chilling on anchor. Storage is one of the most important parts of overnight adventures and the 2380 has ample room in her belly for all your bits and pieces. The Whitley CR 2380 is as comfortable as she is versatile. Over the course of the last few days, we've explored the Mile Lakes region and we've fished, we've wakeboarded, barbecued and slept aboard this baby and she's lapped up every minute. <laughs>